Good afternoon and, and welcome. There might be other colleagues and students joining us, but it's time we made a start. And it uh, gives me a great pleasure to welcome you to this um, research seminar hosted by the Open Road Research Initiative. Um, the cross-language dynamics reshaping community research program, and in particular, the translingual strand of the research program, which is led by Professor Catherine Davis. And I'm very glad that uh, Catherine is with us uh, this afternoon. And very grateful to the Institute for Modern Languages Research uh, for hosting this uh, event, and also to, to, to John for all his help in organizing this uh, event. Um, before I introduce our speakers, I'm also very uh, tempted to mention that uh, in the audience this afternoon we also have the uh, former British ambassador to uh, Georgia, Mr. Jenkins. So it's, it's very um, good to have you with uh, us, all the more so since one of the presentations will be on uh, Georgia. So um, this is a, a research event uh, in the Open World Research Initiative framework, and it is about exploring linguistic diversity in, in Moscow. And we have three speakers who will give uh, two different uh, presentations. Um, the first presentation on linguistic diversity of, of Moscow will be delivered by um, uh, Yulia Mazorovna and uh, Marina uh, Askvatkina. And they're both from the Institute of uh, Linguistics. Did I get this wrong? Yes, perfectly. Ah, thank you. Perfectly wrong. Good. <laughs> they're both from the Institute of Linguistics of the Russian Academy of Sciences in, in uh, Moscow. And um, Yulia uh, Ma Mazorovna a senior researcher at the Institute of Linguistics. And the range of her scholarly interests includes typology of spatial indicators, semantics, morphology, linguistic typology, area linguistics, field linguistics, corpus linguistics, Indo Aryan languages, Iranian languages, Caucasian languages, Ossetian language, and Attica language. Um, and, um, in 2002-2003, she worked at the Department of Oriental Languages at the Institute of Linguistics uh, as a teacher of Persian. Since 2000, she has been working with the Languages of the World group at the same institute and is currently a senior research associate in the area linguistics uh, sector of the institute. Now, Ma Marina Raskwatkina um, uh, participates uh, since 2006 in the research group languages of, of Moscow, and she was also participant in the research team linguistic and socio-cultural studies in Alaska. Uh, and before that, from 2001 to 2005, she was a lecturer at the Faculty of Journalism in Stavropol State University. The research uh, focuses on ethnology, ethnolinguistics, virtual anthropology, genealogy, Alaskan indigenous peoples, information technologies, geoinformation technologies, and social sciences and education. And um, even though uh, these will be two different uh, presentations, I take this occasion to introduce also Denis Zobalov, who will give the second presentation on Greek and Georgian uh, language communities in Moscow, who comes to us from the Higher School of Economics, National Research University in uh, Moscow, where he is assistant professor in the School of Philology and program academic supervisor for the program in language policy in the context of ethnocultural diversity. 
Uh, his PhD is in linguistics, uh, uh, is from the Linguistics University of Cyprus in English studies, with a, a thesis on sociolinguistic investigation of the processes of language shift, language maintenance, the case of Pontic Greeks in Cyprus. He also has a, an MA in Applied Linguistics from the University of Essex, and uh, before then a BA in English Language and Literature from the University of Cyprus. So uh, as you can see, we're drawing an increasing uh, audience, so even before your presentations can start, <laughs> just imagine once they start, uh, people will be talking to you. But uh, we agree that each presentation will uh, last about 30 minutes, and at the end of both presentations, we'll open the floor for a discussion. Um, over to you. Thank you very much for this kind of presentation. And I would like to appreciate everybody to come to our talk and uh, uh, our hosts who invited us. And my talk will outline the main results of the Languages of Moscow project, which uh, studies uh, the urban multilingualism in Russian capital city. And more specifically, I examine how different languages function in Moscow and uh, the Moscow metropolitan area. It was in the early 2000s, when uh, the current director of our institute, Andrei Kibri, expressed an idea that Moscow is a completely unknown linguistic area that we need to investigate. And uh, none of the studies were carried out before. It's strange. But only several years later, we could uh, put together a team of specialists in linguistics, social linguistics, education, uh, intercultural communication, and political science. Uh, and uh, we started uh, to investigate uh, Moscow's social, uh, social linguistic situation. And our project, uh, Languages of Moscow, was launched only in 2016. And uh, I will tell about some preliminary results we uh, have already had. Uh, our research was supported by Russian Foundation for Basic Research. And uh, the aims of our project uh, were to describe Moscow as a multilingual metropolis. And uh, to estimate the number of uh, speakers of languages, the number of languages, the degree of language maintenance uh, in the different ethnic groups, to investigate uh, the functional aspects of language use in ethnic groups, uh, the degree of knowledge of Russian in different uh, ethnic groups and uh, also to study the Moscow's uh, government language and education policy. And here you can see a brief outline of the methods we have used in our research. We have analyzed uh, the census data, uh, which uh, we found incomplete in some uh, respects, but uh, still useful. And uh, also we used a mixed method approach, uh, like individual and group interviews, questionnaires and in-group observation. We decided that uh, the best way to know something is to ask people, and we did a lot of talking to people. We uh, conducted a lot of interviews with adults and children, and also language activists and some people in charge. <clears throat> so we interviewed everybody we could. And uh, we collected so far uh, about 2,000 questionnaires from school children, uh, and I will focus on the uh, interviews, semi-structured interviews with adult bilinguals. Uh, we recorded all the interviews and also we transcribed with the help of students, most of them. So we have a quite big corpus of the speech of uh, people about their experience uh, of life in Moscow, about uh, their attitudes to languages, to the uh, ethnic language, to Russian language, and about uh, the experience uh, of integrating into the Russian society, into Moscow, uh, community, into Moscow life. Uh, ah. <clears throat> okay. uh, what uh, I would like to uh, tell what we uh, 
we want to say when we say languages of Moscow? We mean only ethnic languages of people who live uh, in Moscow and have some ethnic background. Uh, no, uh, we do not include foreign languages in our study. Of course, uh, there are a lot of people in Moscow who learn foreign languages, but uh, this is not a uh, point of our research. Our respondents uh, who we interviewed were bilingual or multilingual adults living in Moscow or Moscow region for quite a long time, several years, or permanently. Uh, some of them are first generation newcomers, migrants, some of them were born in Moscow, but uh, their parents are, are of some uh, other origin. Uh, we uh, didn't take into account tourists and short-term visitors. And uh, what we understand, uh, understood when we started our research uh, that it is uh, quite difficult to uh, get into some communities because some communities are quite closed and uh, they won't ta tell to strangers any information. Uh, so you can't just uh, come up to them and ask what language do you use, what, how are you, do you like uh, your life in Moscow. Well, uh, they just won't uh, answer you. So we uh, recruited some members of the communities with uh, academic background. Some of them were students or PhD students, some of them uh, are <coughs> researchers from our own institute uh, or uh, some specialists in languages, in certain languages like Chinese, Vietnamese, because we didn't have uh, people of Chinese or Vietnamese origin, but we have specialists in their languages, in our institute. So, <coughs> With the help of uh, our interviewers <coughs> and researchers, we collected this corpus of interviews. And uh, also an important uh, notion of ethnolinguistic community. What I mean when I say uh, ethnolinguistic community? Uh, we use this term for research, mm, but uh, we do not claim that every language in Moscow has its own community. According to the census uh, 2010, there are 182 languages in Moscow. And, uh, well, not every language has uh, corresponds to, any community, uh, to a community of some kind. So, <clears throat> the typology of communities in Moscow is very diverse. Some of them are very big and active and visible, and uh, some of these communities are uh, non-existent in practice because uh, there are some people with certain ethnic background, uh, they came from some place and they have some language and we unite them under this term linguistic community but uh, they do not have any connections between themselves and uh, there are quite a few in Moscow. Um, typically uh, uh, these uh, all the ethno-linguistic communities in Moscow are very heterogeneous in many respects, including level of knowledge of their ethnic language and uh, level of knowledge of Russian. But we can uh, see some tendencies based on social activities of the community uh, and the data we obtained from the interviews. Well, but we should keep in mind that every migration history is individual and of course uh, Every, uh, we cannot tell uh, anything uh, based, ba based only on the ethnic background of a person. Okay, since the period of early 90s, uh, there has been a rise in migration flows mm, after uh, the fall, fall of the Soviet Union. And the uh, relatively recent phenomenon of rapidly increasing migration flows in multiple forms channels has been termed super diversity and the super diversity framework uh, relates to the image of the world of, in one city and uh, first it was uh, used to describe London but it's applicable to Moscow as well. Uh, I will outline a brief historical context of the Moscow socio-linguistic so situation. Uh, in the USSR, before 90s, migration flows were quite low, and mostly internal migration of Russian-speaking people uh, was the case. How if, uh, after the USSR collapsed? Is this the yeah. <coughs> mm. yeah. 
and just brief outline of the last slide. Uh, there was a remarkable, a remarkable increase in migration from the post-Soviet countries due to economic and political reasons and also military conflicts. And since uh, early 2000s, economic conditions have been improving in Russia and Moscow. And uh, Moscow is a political financial center. It attracted a large number of economic migrants from many post-Soviet countries. And uh, over the... And, uh, as people from former USSR had some partitions in Russia, it was uh, easier for them to get employed in Moscow. And uh, <clears throat> over the uh, last uh, 20 years, uh, these migration flows of labor migrants from uh, former so Soviet Union are made quite stable, with some changes in set uh, of countries and number of migrants. And the biggest share of uh, labor migrants come from Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Ukraine, and Kyrgyzstan now. And another, another migration flow that forms uh, the social linguistic situation in Moscow is internal migration from different regions of Russia. Some of them uh, are Russian-speaking regions, but some of them have some other ethnic uh, languages. Well, it's a, na a natural uh, direction of migration from villages and smaller towns to the capital. And uh, some people come not alone, but with some language in their position. These two migration, uh, main migration flows form the social linguistic map of Russian capital. Uh, one flow from the former USSR countries and another is internal migration from other uh, republics and uh, subjects of Russian Federation. Uh, mig uh, migration from far abroad uh, plays uh, less role in the picture, linguistic picture of Moscow. Okay. What challenges face people when they come to Moscow? Uh, I mean bilingual people who have languages other than Russian. Uh, I will not uh, tell here about uh, labor migrants who come uh, to Russia only for work, for economic reasons, and want to earn money and go back to their country. And uh, they have uh, other goals, and I will tell uh, uh, I will speak only about uh, integrated communities who uh, live normal life, so to say, uh, and uh, how they uh, learn Russian and how they maintain their ethnic language. And when uh, people come to Moscow, it's a very big metropolis like London, but uh, in uh, Moscow uh, the geographical distrib distribution is uh, not like in European cities. For example, what we saw in Manchester, uh, there are some blocks of ethnic blocks, streets, and you can tell that this uh, district is uh, Jewish and that district is Arabic, but in Moscow uh, there is no such uh, thing like ethnic districts. Because, uh, the, first of all, uh, multi-storied buildings, uh, do not form any kind of communities like cozy neighborhood we saw here. And uh, people are separated from each other. And uh, there are districts uh, with cheap accommodation in Moscow, which are more attractive for migrants, but uh, all uh, people of all nationalities and ethnic backgrounds live there together and uh, do not form geographical, spatial communities. And uh, there are no districts where the uh, maximum share of speakers of other languages than Russian exceeds uh, the Moscow average, like 10 15 percent. And when people come to Moscow, they are main language of communication is Russian, because Russia, uh, Russian capital is very multilingual in many respects. You uh, use Russian everywhere, in education, in uh, official use, uh, 
uh, with people uh, of other nationals. And in, in every uh, <coughs> institution, you can use only Russian. And uh, even English, well, if you ask someone in the street, well, the chances are like 13% that you will be understood. Uh, Russia, uh, Russian capital is very, well, monolingual in this respect. Uh, in spite of the fact that there are a lot of people with other languages. So, uh, what are the main fu functions of ethnic languages in metropolitan city? Uh, first of all, it's symbolic function. Like, uh, people, when they meet and the way they uh, have some common origin, uh, they want to find something they share. And, of course, it's their language. And, uh, but um, uh, it is often the case uh, that they don't uh, use it for communication. They just use it in symbolic function. Like, they greet, uh, greet each other, for example, in Russian or Tatar or something. And then they switch to Russian for communicating. Uh, function. Uh, some uh, uh, communities uh, maintain their language and retain it uh, as a language of religion and rituals. It is a very important function. Uh, some communities use their language as secret language. Uh, and uh, also one of uh, the important uh, functions in the urban environment is inner speech. When you don't have anybody you can speak in your language, but you would like to. Uh, you can uh, use it uh, for singing songs, uh, reading books, uh, or uh, speaking to yourself, speaking to your pets. Uh, it's not a communicative function, but it's a kind of using language, uh, expressing attachment to this language. And I will show some brief examples of uh, communities and their, their strategies to maintain their language. Every uh, they are quite diverse and every community has uh, its own uh, strategies. For example, in Bush people, uh, this is a picture of uh, Rudin, uh, University of Friendship, National Friendship of Moscow, and uh, in Bush people, the, the most uh, solid and united community of Rudayan in uh, 2016. And there are a lot of English students in Moscow, and uh, English uh, are, comes from English Republic of Russian Federation, uh, it's an example of internal migration, but uh, this is a community <coughs> with a good uh, language maintenance and uh, because uh, this is a very closed community, uh, they, there are very few inter-ethnic uh, marriages. They uh, almost uh, always find their partner inside the community, and uh, almost every family uses English as a language of family communication. Here are some points. Sorry. This one. Here are some fragments from the interviews we collected, and uh, I will not read them, but you can. And uh, they all show that uh, people, uh, it is uh, very popular to use English language between themselves, and uh, it is a language of uh, <coughs> communication in all ages. And as a result, uh, the knowledge of English language among this community is very high. But uh, the knowledge of Russian is not so good, and uh, the accent of uh, this uh, of English people is quite specific. You can tell immediately that uh, this uh, person comes from this community because uh, they have a special ethnic of Russian. And when the function of the English language in Moscow is communicative. Another interesting example is the uh, Karachay Balkar people in Moscow. And uh, they are very well established community. There are a lot of qualified specialists, doctors, scientists. It's a quite a known community. They are not newcomers in Moscow. They also come from the Caucasus, 
from uh, two republics of the Caucasus. And uh, there are a lot of people who uh, made a good career in Moscow, uh, who have money and a good social position, and they invest this money and their position and their power in uh, to the support of the society, Karachaybo uh, Society in Moscow. They founded a very interesting uh, organization, El Bosoid, uh, which promotes every kind of activities uh, and language maintenance, including translation of books, films, and cartoons for children, which is very important, and urban settings, uh, because children, when they uh, watch cartoons, uh, they learn language, and it's interesting for them. And they also develop apps for smartphones, for dictionaries, uh, for new generation. So they promote language among young people, and it's very important. Next uh, example, I'm short of time, so I will tell briefly about Chuvash people. Uh, there's a very interesting description of uh, Chuvash people in Moscow, and uh, uh, the language vitality in the Chuvash Republic is not so high as uh, <coughs> Caucasus, in, as in Bush and Bokhar. So when um, Chuvash people come to Moscow, uh, they are not uh, have very high proficiency in Chuvash already, usually. It depends on person, but in general. And so, uh, what uh, do Chuvash activists do to promote their language? They uh, organize uh, discos for young people, uh, where Chuvash music plays, where Chuvash people come, and the main language of uh, communication there is Chuvash. And many uh, couples uh, meet there, and well, it's a good way to maintain the language <laughs> because if uh, both are of the same origin or of the same language, it's uh, a good chance to transmit uh, this language to children. And also, there are a lot of virtual community and social networks. Moscow Chuvash who are also very active and uh, they use Chuvash language in these uh, social networks. Very interesting community from one, just one example because uh, the time is very limited, but one example of uh, post-Soviet community. Uh, family people, they come from uh, Gorno Badakhshan Autonomous District in Tajikistan, and they are actually speakers of several Iranian languages, Shubnam, Shan, Bahan, Gizbulam, Mishkashim, and others. And also they speak Tajik, so they are multilingual. And uh, in Tajikistan they uh, also learn Russian at school, so they have some proficiency in Russian when they come, uh, usually, but not all of them. There are a lot of Pamiri people in Moscow and Moscow region because of uh, military conflicts in Tajikistan. The migration flow was very large in the 90s and uh, in recently the uh, predominant uh, type of migrants are uh, labor migrants. Uh, as uh, these people uh, are very uh, united, solidary community. They prefer to live together, to live in big families. They come in big families with children, grand, uh, children, grandfathers and grandmothers. So all the generation come to Russia because the economic situation in Tajikistan is very hard. And if uh, they have chance to move, well, they just use it. And. Uh, they are very organized community, they have uh, organizations, religious organizations and cultural organizations as well. And um, their knowledge of, of Russian and Pamir languages in this group very is a lot. And we have a special uh, uh, investigation on this. But what is, what I want to say here is uh, that
um, what is good for this uh, community is uh, that uh, the newcomers can uh, teach the old generation, so to say, uh, Pamiri languages and uh, those who already were born in Moscow help with the Russian language to the newcomers. So, very high ethnic solidarity. They demonstrate a very high ethnic solidarity. And also, there is a very active weekend school and summer schools are organized where Tajik, Pamiri languages, culture and religion are studied. And uh, since uh, the 90s, uh, there were several thousand people who, taught, who were taught in this school. Okay, all these uh, studies of communities are published in the uh, journal. This, uh, it is out this year, it was published this year. And those who, can, uh, who read Russian can, <laughs> can read it uh, in detail. And uh, I think I should give, yes, uh, just brief factors that influence uh, language vitality in Moscow are uh, the number of speakers in Moscow is very important. Big communities have uh, more opportunities to maintain their language. Institutional support is very important. And the main important thing is uh, the active position of community itself and the people who belong to it and who have loyalty to their culture. And I think I will... <coughs> Hello, Julia. Hi. I will just present the uh, next part of our uh, collaborative research. Uh, I will talk about the children from foreign families in Moscow school system. Previously, there were, uh, there were a limited number of foreign children in the Soviet Union before the 1990s, as there uh, were few contacts between the Russian uh, residents and foreign countries. When the USSR collapsed, children from the Soviet Republic became foreigners, following their parents, who start moving to Russia to solve their various problems like ethnic conflicts, uh, multi-ethnic family disintegration, economic difficulties, uh, they began to arrive to Russia. According to the official data of the Moscow Department of Education, there were 25,357 children from the families of foreign citizens uh, in Moscow in the 2014-15 academic year. In total, children from uh, nine, 95 countries study in Moscow schools. 15 of them are countries of the former USSR and 80 are from other foreign countries. Uh, next slide, we can see uh, the official data uh, about the distribution of people from families of foreign citizens in education institutions of Moscow according to country. We, we can see that the most representative groups are from Vietnam, Afghanistan, Israel, Serbia, Syria and China. These groups range from 670 persons to 70, which is totally 60% of the summary number of students from abroad. And uh, representatives of the former USSR countries amount to 22%. But what about these people? People. As, as for visitors from the post USSR countries in Moscow, the date of school children, these are always on the next slide. <coughs> next slide. In the recent years, the proportion of visitors from Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Ukraine, as well as Transnistria, has increased. But at the same time, there are fair children from the Transcaucasian Republic, republics, Armenia, Azerbaijan and Georgia. And we, what about schools these people are talking uh, Children from Europe and North America, as well as industrialized countries of Asia, are sent by the parents, mainly businessmen, employees, or diplomatic and counselor institutions, to private educational institutions. 
institutions. For instance, in the recent years, the numbers of children from China has decreased in Moscow, and those who are still there study in private schools with English as a language of instruction. Embassies of large numbers of countries have their own school with instruction in national languages. They issue national diploma of secondary education, including schools at the embassies of the United States, Canada, Great Britain, Poland, Denmark, Belgium, a school at the embassy of Iraq. Uh, uh, almost uh, all students from the post USSR country study in public uh, municipal schools. There are mostly children from the families of so called labor migrants. If their parents, while in Moscow, can provide their families with housing, care, and get a work permit, they bring their children to Russia and send them to school. Most often, foreign children, mainly from migrant families uh, from the former USSR and Vietnam, get into non prestigious schools or school experience a deficit of pupils. Schools are funded by the state uh, in accordance with the number of students. Of course, the lack of prestige and the desire of parents to put their children in this school are related directly. It's necessary to mention another group of students who are citizens of Russian Federation, so they are not represented in the statistic of official migration. These are children from the families of internal migrants, people who came to Moscow from other regions of the Russian Federation. These children form a large group in school. Ethnic regions are regions of Russia that have an ethnic designation in their name, such as the Tatar Republic, the Chechen Republic, the Dagestan, but they are still among the regular regions in our country. It's very significant and interesting from the point of view of their cultural and linguistic background. This is especially true of children from North Caucasus Republic. Research on the proficiency in the Russian language is controversial. However, they are also of interest to our project as the speakers of dozens of other native languages. What about the density of foreign children in Moscow school? According to the various study, there is no significant concentration of certain ethnic group in particular areas. However, there are studies have studies showing that the proportion of students, non-native speakers of Russian, in some schools is up to 25% or even, even higher. Typically, there are about uh, two or four non-native speakers in Russian in high school classes. In the middle grades, there are five or five of them. More children attend primary school. As the principal and teachers remarked, during the last three four years, the number of non-native speaking in Russian children is increasing in lower grade. And next, I will speak about uh, Moscow government education policy uh, and um, how the system in Moscow uh, in the early 1990s, Moscow Department of Education started to, to solve problems with linguistic and cultural adaptation of the children who has mother tongue different uh, from Russian, other, other than Russian, and mostly non-speaking Russian. In stage one, early 1990s, group for teaching Russian as a foreign language uh, were created in public school as extracurricular activities. Uh, next stage two, uh, in the end of the 1990s, uh, schools with extracultural components were created. These were several schools with the predominance of children of a certain ethnicity. They studied both in Russian and uh, their native language, Georgian, Greek, uh, Azerbaijan, Ivrit, and so on. And the next stage, uh, to, um, to, to thousands, early 2000s. Special preparatory one-year classes were opened in the schools for the children who do not speak Russian. These classes are called Russian language school. In our case, we will call them schools with intense Russian program, IRPT. And well, these schools. There were 10 such schools in Moscow in 2015, now only two, two due to financial reasons. 
Earlier ARPC schools enrolled about uh, 300, 400 children of different ages per year in total. Until 2017, education in these classes was free of charge. As soon as parents were faced with the need to pay for education, they stopped sending children to these specialized classes. Uh, to the bright children's disappointment, uh, teachers' disappointments, some of them mentioned it in private talk to our colleagues, uh, uh, all the senior office mentor of the, the teacher in uh, bilingual school. Uh, parents do not send their children to preparatory classes to study Russian, even free of charge. They prefer that the children go to general educational classes directly. Uh, on the whole, the system of RAPC had a great influence on the adaptation of children, non-native speakers, but now such schools have become unprofitable. So now, since 2013, the system of public education is being reorganized in Moscow. There are no more schools or kindergartens with an ethnocultural component, uh, as I mentioned, and almost no ERPC as a system. We can recall this uh, in the historical context uh, of the development of the system of ethnocultural education. Now, uh, Moscow schools are united into complexes of educational institutions along with kindergarten, from 3 to 10 uh, institutions in one complex. Now, about uh, 550 such complexes, including over 2,000 educational institutions in Moscow. Institutions in Moscow. Now, the school can develop its own educational strategy, including in the field of teaching children with a non-native language. Of course, schools operate within the national education standards and basic educational program, but they are free to choose an individual educational pathway for each student who needs it. And now, in general, it's necessary to mention that's a problem all over the world, how to help children from our other countries to integrate into the education system and how to teach them. Uh, we have special institutions, Moscow Center for, for the Development of Human Research in the Education, was established by the Department of Education and Science of the Moscow government. It's an official institution for the professional development of teachers uh, of Moscow schools. Uh, staff of majority of Moscow schools is trained to develop the individual territories of teaching students within the framework of official standards and educational programs. Its center develops manuals and methodological guides for teaching children Russian as a foreign language and textbooks for school children. One of the members of our project uh, team, Languages of Moscow, Olga Senova, specialized in teaching Russian as a foreign language and has been working as a mentor for the teachers of Moscow school for many years. Uh, let's, we have, uh, in the system we have non-governmental education central, there are also activity, uh, Saudi schools and the embassies of ethnic communities, uh, for example, the non-profit organization Kids a Kids, Kids a Kids conducted classes based on the school curriculum for, choose, for those children who cannot attend secondary schools due to problem with the legal status of the family. Uh, next, uh, I, I will present uh, uh, our I present uh, part of our study, only part of our study of the Moscow Mainstream School. It's not an ordinary school because most of the students have, as, uh, as their ethnic language, different than Russian. To aim our project, we have developed a questionnaire for children <coughs> containing 24 sections. In addition to personal ethnic and linguistic characteristics, our questionnaire contains a number of questions about the family language history, what language uh, the child uh, speaks with parents and relatives, the usage of language in very, uh, Various environments, self-assessment on languages, competence, uh, Russian, native, some other languages. Uh, the questionnaire were collected through personal contacts with school teachers. 
In total, we received more than 1,777 completed questionnaires in the eight Moscow secondary and supplementary schools in 2017. The information allowed us to develop a methodology of data collection, data analysis, and to be prepared for a large-scale study. This activity was organized by members of our team, Olga Senova. Uh, about the school. The, the, um, for understanding the language situation, we need to work with family language history, not only with official data. And what uh, our view of this school? Uh, the case is school uh, due to predominance of children with many different linguistic backgrounds. This analysis will help us to find correlation for working with a large amount of data. But definitely, we cannot extrapolate this data to all schools of Moscow to the general uh, ethnolinguistic situation due to limited data. But in this school, we gathered about uh, 2,000 questionnaires, and the total school population is about uh, uh, 3,060 people, and uh, about 80% uh, of the children have indicated the ethnic language other than Russian. Uh, what about? Pupils mention 17, 17 languages as their native languages except Russian. And uh, the, these children indicate the following countries, 20, as the homeland. You can see this slide. And only one slide about brief comparison of the data. We have analyzed the answer to uh, several questions, but now I uh, show you only one. Uh, one comparison. Here we separated a group of children from the post-Soviet countries, the, uh, then compared the answer to these two questions. Which language is easiest you to speak and what language to, do you speak to your parents? And the comparison of the data, sh data shows us children prefer to choose as easiest to speak one language. A minority, minority is able to speak both. Majority want to choose one language, and 45 choose the native language. The choice of priority language, language differs from the language of real communication in the close family. Of course, uh, a more nuanced categorization is needed, uh, but the importance of family language policy in language acquisition is evident. Our work on data analysis is the case has just begun. I conclude and uh, let my colleague to uh, general conclusion of our talk. That school data uh, extends our knowledge about Moscow linguistic picture and uh, the most important thing we found uh, for maintaining language in the urban settings is language activism. Thank you. I think we <laughs> took more, <laughs> taken more time than we were supposed to. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Um, yeah, we'll move to the next presentation. And you have uh, yes, the, we have. the chance to give you proper applause at the very end <laughs> yes, after I the think questions. Yes. <laughs> I was hoping to take more time, but now <laughs> I don't have much time. Um, so basically, uh, my interest in the two communities, the Georgian and the Greek, uh, stems from the fact that I was born in Georgia, and I lived there, I spent my childhood years. I used to speak Georgian, uh, but at the age of five, I migrated to Russia, so Georgian is gone. Um, and my interest in the Greek community is that my father is born to Greek, so it's a community that um, is very, very close to me. So I'm basically part of the community. Um, okay, so um, it, it must be mentioned that these are the two communities uh, that I approach, two different approaches to the, in, in my process of investigation. And uh, the, the group community, is, I have just started my um, 
the research. In the Greek community, I will briefly outline the... Um, I'll give you just very brief information uh, about the <coughs> community, and then I'll move on to my case study in, in the Georgian um, in the Georgian school in Moscow. Okay, so basically, very briefly, who are Pontic Greeks? Pontic Greeks are slightly different from Greeks that live in, in modern in, in Greece, mainland Greece. So the history of Pontus dates back to 8th century. Uh, and um, uh, these are the areas of Pontus that are located in the uh, northeastern part of today's Turkey. So the fall of Constantinople in 1453, as well as the conquest of the capital city of Pontus, uh, triggered massive outflow of Pontic Greeks to the northern parts, which were Georgia, Russia uh, at the time. So basically, uh, we see kind of continuous migration to the north, and the final uh, massive uh, outflow of Pontic Greeks uh, was uh, after the Greco Turkish conflict at the beginning of the 20th century. It must be pointed out that in the mid 1990s, in the mid 1950s, uh, some Greeks were deported from Crimea and from North Caucasus to, uh, to Asia, to Kazakhstan. Um, and after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, many Pontic Greeks were free to go to what many call uh, historical motherland, mainly to Greece and Cyprus. Um, basically, yes, I'm part of the flow that moved to Cyprus and I spent 20 years there. Okay. Uh, when it comes to Greeks in Moscow, we have two large groups, basically the Pontic Greeks and the Greeks from mainland Greece. Uh, when it comes to Pontic Greeks, uh, we, uh, we see people from Georgia, from North Caucasus, from Russia, and from Kazakhstan. And it's a, it's a bilingual, multilingual community speaking uh, at least two languages. Russian, Turkish, and very few of them speak the Pontic Greek dialect, which is a highly endangered uh, language uh, dialect today. Um, and what we see, and I will show you in, in a couple of slides later, that the communities, the, the communities, are, the the particular community is trying to uh, revive the language, and it's not Pontic Greek; it's the standard modern Greek. But when it comes to the uh, Greeks who came to Russia, mainly for studies or business or some got married, uh, they had a slightly different purpose. They have to linguistically and culturally um, get integrated into the Russian society. Okay, so when we, when we talk about identity, the issue of the Pontic Greek identity and the label Greek, uh, yeah, Greek, okay, uh, is uh, put into question. Okay, so we see like kind of duality. Some people identify themselves as Pontic Greeks. Others say, no, I'm not a Pontic, or I'm not a Pontic Greek. I'm just Greek. Okay, so this is this has to be investigated in, in Moscow. And as we see, there is a kind of language shift uh, following the mainstream <coughs> language ideologies when it comes to the Pontic Greeks who spoke the Turkish dialect called the Rum. Uh, so they have. Uh, to a large extent, become uh, Russified, so Russified, uh, and Pontic Greeks also uh, started speaking uh, the Russian language. Uh, and what is interesting is that uh, when it comes to cultural practices, the community didn't acquire the Russian uh, cultural patterns, but instead they preferred to acquire purely Greek cultural patterns. So if you go to any particular uh, wedding, in, in Russia, Greek wedding, it will be almost similar to any wedding that, uh, that um, is taking place in Greece. So with Greek music, Greek songs, Greek dances. Okay? Um, and I was interested to, uh, to look at the activities that the Moscow community of Greeks uh, is currently uh, doing. So basically, what they state on their website is that they want to maintain the Greek identity of uh, Greeks who live in, in Moscow. So they say the aim of the Greek community of Moscow is to maintain the national ethnic identity of Russian citizens of Greek origin that are permanent residents of Moscow and greater Moscow area. And also uh, they have uh, their mission 
uh, to teach the Greek language. So a Greek language, the, there is a school uh, that teaches the Greek, the Greek language, and uh, they state that there were around 200 students. I went to the school, unfortunately I didn't find that many students. Uh, but they are quite active. So what activities do they do? Basically they celebrate all major celebrations, uh, national celebrations, uh, Greek celebrations, okay? Such as the, uh, the No Day, such as the uh, 25th December, which is Greek Christmas, as some of you may know, Russians celebrate Christmas on the 6th of January. Um, the 25th of March, which is the Greece Independence Day. And 19th of May, uh, to commemorate the Ponte Greek genocide. And in order to attract people, they quite often recruit such stars as the Russian cosmonaut with Greek origin, Fyodor uh, the one of the uh, famous Russian actors of Greek origin, um, Kurtzidis, and uh, to like 90% like of the events that I attended, I saw the uh, Greek ambassador to Russia from uh, to, Mar to Russia. Yes, so he he is always there, and he. Uh, gives a speech in the Greek with translation into Russian. So basically they maintain quite close relations with mainland, mainland Greece and uh, they attract, uh, they try to attract more and more people to be actively engaged, to be active uh, participants of the community. What else do they do? Uh, quite recently they have uh, designed and they have started a uh, WhatsApp um, kind of you know, group with, uh, which is called Greek Moscow, and they post different events, uh, and in my communication with them, they basically uh, duplicate all the information that they send via email, but they found out that email is not effective, so they started kind of uh, getting into more um, uh, social networks. So what do they do? They uh, organize on a regular basis different competitions for kids, like uh, language competitions, Olympiads, any drawing competitions related to, to Greece. Uh, they try to find a spouse, a Greek spouse, and I will show uh, how in the next slide. And for members, there are certain privileges. If you're a member of the community, you get discounts at different Greek restaurants that exist in Moscow and uh, different shops that are owned by uh, rich, wealthy Greeks. And of course, they organize regular summer camps for children to master to improve their Greek language skills. Okay. So this is the, uh, the photos I got just today. Uh, there was a party uh, in Moscow two, two days ago, I think, or one day ago. And um, they basically invite youth, Greek youth, to uh, celebrate, to dance to Greek uh, songs and music. And um, they advertise this quite actively in different social uh, media, like Facebook, uh, yes. And finally, um, two years ago they have launched a program uh, where they teach the Greek language in public Russian schools. So this is different. Uh, what, I, uh, what I mentioned earlier was the kind of weekend school where children go and um, learn only the language. So this is the program that um, was launched by active members of the community and they teach the Greek language uh, to uh, students in public school. Okay, the Georgian community. So very, uh, again, briefly, um, the historical background, I mean, as you know, Moscow is a very, uh, it's a highly diverse city. Uh, there are many languages, there are tourists, I mean, I'm not going to dwell on that because uh, Yula and uh, Marina uh, mentioned that. So basically, with the fall of the Soviet Union, we have a influx of migration from this region into uh, Moscow, and of course different conflicts uh, have boosted uh, migration flows to the north. So uh, many uh, families migrated to the capital uh, city, and some of them didn't have the knowledge of the Russian language. And, um, the educational system had to respond to language needs of those newly arrived migrants uh, in order to you know, make 
um, their integration uh, um, you know, more smooth. Um, so basically, that was one of the reasons why schools with an ethnocultural component were established. And today I'm going to talk about one particular school uh, that was established, and this is the state school with the Georgian ethnocultural uh, component. So basically, uh, it started as a, ki as a kindergarten, then in mid-1990s, a uh, proper school was built, uh, and 2006 around, there were around 800 students uh, in that particular school, and uh, after the military conflict of 2008, we witnessed massive exodus of uh, Georgians uh, from Moscow. And uh, in 2016, the school was merged with uh, another school and it ceased to exist as an independent unit. So it's part of the uh, uh, larger school unit. I mean, it has no this particular name. Now it's just a proper Russian school. Okay, so that was the school. And this is a typical Russian winter day. Okay, um, so back uh, in this school, uh, there were around 300 students. But so this is the information that I got from the official website. But when I did my field work in the school, I uh, basically found kind of, uh, that there were uh, fewer students in classrooms. Uh, and when I asked the headmaster, she said, "The thing is that children come and go." Okay, we kind of, you know, these are the migrants that, that come, they stay for half a year, they may go, or they may come for one or two years, and they may go. So there is kind of, um, the situation is not static. Okay. And when it comes to teachers, uh, most, of the, most of the students are from, uh, are of Georgian uh, in background. And, um, uh, the majority of teachers are also uh, of a Georgian background, some of them are Mikrelian. And it should be pointed out that none of them have any kind of uh, training when it comes to bilingual education. So basically teachers had to devise, had to come up uh, themselves with the uh, particular training for, of course, a particular program for kids who didn't speak the Russian language. So the school is centrally located, if you look at the map, so here is Moscow city, and the school is located right here, uh, which is quite central. Okay, so the aim was to assess the role that homeland and uh, language that plays in uh, ethnic and cultural self-identification of Georgian students. And what is the role of the school in this particular, mat in this particular matter? So uh, I'm drawing on the sociolinguistic, um, the sociocultural linguistic uh, identity theoretical framework proposed by Buchholz and Hall. So it states that uh, identity is a product of linguistic and other semiotic practices. It also claims that identity is a social and cultural phenomenon, and it may be linguistically indexed through different uh, labels. And in part, it consists of um, it's a construct of others' perceptions and representations, and in part, it's the outcome of larger ideological processes. And it should be also uh, mentioned the notion of ethnicity. Four points out that ethnicity is um, a socially constructed unit, and it is basically subject to change uh, in light of different ideological views. And this implies that people may redefine themselves Okay, uh, and change their identity, change their ethnic identity when certain circumstances force it. And language can often be regarded as a prime indicator of ethnic identity, and link, the link between language and ethnicity is not fixed, but rather fluid. So basically, I conducted my fieldwork in 2015-2016 in the academic year, uh, 74 questionnaires were filled out by students, and these are the questionnaires that are different from those that were mentioned earlier. And uh, we conducted some uh, interviews with uh, Yula and with my other colleagues, um, and we wanted to look at uh, the language practices 
in that particular school. So just a brief um, information on the uh, brief demographic information. So slightly more than half of them were born in Russia, and around 43% uh, of the students were born in, in Georgia. So when it comes to interviews, we conducted four individual interviews and four group interviews. Interviews with teachers mainly and group interviews with students of uh, different grades and one group interview with two teachers of uh, Russian and uh, Georgian. Okay, so uh, we were interested to look at the main role of the Georgian teacher in that particular school and we found out that teachers sharing the same background, linguistic, cultural, ethnic, could facilitate students to foster their identity as Georgians. They could also facilitate integration of newly arrived students who didn't speak the Russian language, and they were also mediators between the two cultures. And, as I'm going to show you a bit later, they also function as parents in this particular school. Okay, the first interview. Um, this is the interview with Maya Gibi, who uh, teach the Georgian and the Russian language respectively. I asked them, what is the main role, the main function of a teacher in the school with an ethnocultural component? And Maya says, you know what's the main role here? Children must, be, must know their culture, religion, their past, and that they must be brought up as if they are in Georgia. So what she's trying to stress here is that we live in a different environment, different linguistic environment. Our kids grow um, in, in Moscow, which is kind of different from Georgia, but our mission is to uh, create the circumstances for our children to feel as if they, as if they are in Georgia. And uh, this is reminiscent of what Fishman calls patrimony, that is behavioral or implementational system that is what members of a particular ethnic group do in order to express their membership, including pedagogical patterns. Okay, and this is the question uh, that relates to the stated mother tongue. So the, the, the questionnaire, they were directly asked, what is your mother tongue? And as we can see, the vast majority um, expressed that their mother tongue is Georgian. However, some questions later, we also asked them, what is how do you evaluate your proficiency uh, in, the, in the Georgian and the Russian language? And as we can see, only one, a third of them reported to have medium or low proficiency in the Georgian language. And slightly more than half expressed that they are more proficient in the Russian language. So we see that the Georgian language plays uh, or has a symbolic load here. And uh, let's take a look at the language practices within the classroom and uh, out of the classroom. So they were asked what language or languages do you use to address the teacher in the classroom or outside the classroom. So here we say that uh, most of the students, around 70%, reported to use uh, mostly or only Russian in the classroom. Okay, and only one third of them reported to use both languages. And um, here the um, in, in the interviews with teachers, they, the teachers expressed that we give room for newly arrived students to express themselves in the classroom in order to make the, um, the lesson um, more efficient so that they could understand and follow the uh, subject matter. However, when it comes to outside of the classroom, we see that the number of students speaking Georgian increases and it rises up to 56% uh, along with, with the Russian and uh, around 7% of students reported to use only the Georgian language in communication with teachers outside the uh, classroom walls. Okay, and here's the, um, the interview excerpt with the teacher, Georgian teacher who teaches the Russian language and he stresses the importance of the Russian language and culture for the students. So he says, I believe we need to familiarize children, our students certainly, with the great Russian culture in the first place. I say this as a teacher of the Russian language because our classrooms are multinational. In the seventh grade, there are five nationalities. 
Yes, in our class, the role of the teacher, the role of the teacher, not neglecting the national culture, maintaining traditions, yes, mm -hmm, customs, values, is to familiarize them with the great Russian culture in the first place. So what we witness here is that this particular teacher stresses the fact that students have to learn the Russian culture, and which he calls great Russian culture. But this shouldn't be done at the expense of the Greek language, of the Greek traditions or values. Sorry, Georgian. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. And uh, now let's take a look at the ethnicity uh, that uh, the students reported to uh, have. So in, 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 in Russian, the word ethnicity kind of doesn't know. Exist. So basically, we ask nationality, which correlates, which corresponds to um, ethnicity. So, as we can see, when kids were directly asked, uh, What is your nationality? What is your ethnicity? Like, the dominant majority stated that they're Georgians. Okay? But when it comes to who do you feel you are, to this particular question, we see a kind of you know, different picture. We see that still slightly more than half of them report that they are, they feel that they're Georgians, but what we found interesting is that some of them had this particular vestige, uh, which is which they feel is part of them. Okay? So some of them express that they're Moscovite Georgians, some of them uh, report that they're Russian Georgians, and in, in one of the interviews, some of them I think mentioned that uh, we feel a bit different from our peers that live in Georgia because they usually travel uh, for summer holidays uh, to Georgia to spend the summer with uh, their grandparents and they make friends with them and they said that we see differences okay and this might be related to the uh, so-called regional identity and uh, what I also found interesting is the role of the uh, country of origin that uh, place in the cultural self-identification of, of some students. So this is the uh, group interview excerpt with uh, 11 great students, they are school leaders, they go to university and one of them says the following, I would like to stay here but I often miss Georgia because we've got everything so to say. We don't have this development but you see we've got mountains, we've got sea, I don't know, we've got such a beautiful country. But here, there are more opportunities than there. I'd like to stay here. I was born here. I got used to living here. I've got my own friends here. But Georgia is closer to me. So we see this kind of ambivalent uh, attitude to Georgia and Russia. On the one hand, uh, we see very high emotional attachment to the country, although she was born in Russia. Okay, she kind of praises the beautiful nature of, uh, of Georgia, but at the same time, uh, she looks at her future career uh, that she uh, that she states that you know there are more opportunities in Moscow here than in, in Georgia, and it should be stressed that her wish to stay in Russia doesn't hinder uh, her from associating herself with uh, with the country, and this uh, could be. Uh, argued that students may kind of trespass different boundaries when it comes to identity in, in terms of uh, fluidity. Okay, and let's take a look at uh, the results with uh, homeland versus group belonging. So the students were asked, what is your homeland? Okay, and we see that around 63% stated that it is Georgia, uh, around 18% reported that it is both uh, Russia and Georgia, they feel kind of two homelands, allegiance to two countries. Uh, and when it comes to group belonging, again, this is very interesting that around 85% reported that they belong, at, belong in both communities, Russian and Georgian. And this is the uh, interview with 7th uh, grade students uh, where we discuss the differences between uh, attending a purely Russian school and this particular school. And I asked them, if you had the opportunity to choose between a Russian school and this school, which one would you choose? And all of them shouted, this school, of course. 
while in school it's better and the other student says it's like a family teachers are like our parents here so basically we see a different attitude of teachers to the uh, students who actually feel this attitude so basically the atmosphere that I mean, uh, I went to the school, I spent uh, half a year, almost half a year at the school, and indeed, it's a different school to uh, what I uh, saw in Russian schools. So basically, there's indeed this, this atmosphere of home, of family, and uh, teachers who share the same ethnic background uh, with students, this could have a very positive uh, role when it comes to attitudes to the uh, language of origin of those students on the one hand and to, uh, to create positive attitudes to their identity as Georgians. And this is just to give you an idea what the school looks like. So we see on, on the school walls the different pictures of uh, Georgian landscape, of Georgian uh, capital city, Tbilisi, and in one of the corridors you see huge posters of uh, famous uh, literary heroes uh, of Georgian authors and poets. And this is the school which is built on the territory of, uh, of the school, the, 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 sorry, the church. <coughs> and the final interview for today, this is the uh, interview with a teacher of history, who says the following, it is precisely in our school where not only Georgians, but also Azerbaijani, Armenian, and other nationalities, we familiarize them with the history of Russia so that they know what country they live in, so that they understand the culture, history, language of this country. Then, I don't like this word tolerance, which means to tolerate. We need to respect each other. That's why I try to, I try to teach them to respect traditions and history of other nations and other countries. As you can see, and she points to the two flags standing uh, on the wall there. There is a Georgian flag and the Russian flag. I somehow want them to be at the same level. And it, indeed, what I found in the school was kind of, you know, quite symbolic pictures. Kind of, you see two flags attached together, okay? Uh, kind of emphasizing the close relationship of Russia and Georgia. And even in, on that picture, the two flags are kind of uh, interwoven, uh, kind of emphasizing the uh, kind of friendship of the two countries. And this is the uh, what I found on the official website of the school. It's a kind of poem, uh, and also they also play with with the words. So they say, two motherlands will resurrect a new life. They have passed through hard a hard way. Two hearts will beat again together. Russia and Georgia. Two hearts. Two destinies, one love. Okay, and we can see that the the word Russian Georgia and one love kind of were written in block letters. So to conclude, what we witness here is a kind of transient identities of students that attend the Georgian uh, school. So basically, these are the identities that change over time uh, under the influence of different socio-historical, socio-political and ideological factors. The negotiation of homeland appears to play an important role in ethnic and cultural identification of students and what we see that this school has all the resources in order to uh, maintain the ethnic language and ethnic identity of the students. So the Georgian language functions as a unifying force because it strengthens students' confidence, motivation, self and self-esteem and the feeling that they are valued in the particular school. Whereas the Russian language uh, is the language of education, is the language of intercultural communication and the language that may give them some economic benefits in the future. And uh, a particular language in this particular school may represent a particular type of identity and a, communi and a communication type. And uh, finally, using different languages these students may enact different identities that uh, they have, and as I have indicated in the results. Mudlow. Thank you.